Hello guys, for this lesson we're going to cover sculpture. We're going to focus a lot on the different techniques, but also materials. A lot of times the materials are correlated with certain techniques. For example, there's some stuff that you can do with clay that you can't do with wood. Or there's some stuff that you can do with metal that you can't do with, say, stone. Now when it comes to the processes, there's two major ways to break it down. You have subtractive and additive processes. A subtractive process is a process that material is taken away to create an artwork. An example of this is carving. If you have a chunk of wood, you're carving away from it to make a statue. Well, material is being taken away, so that's subtractive. Additive is when you're creating an artwork by adding materials together. An example of this is you might be asked by an art teacher to make a clay pot. To make that clay pot, you need to add clay on top of one another to construct it. So you're adding materials together to make that pot. So that's additive. Now let's talk about these different processes. One major process when it comes to art and sculpture is carving. And this is a very, very ancient process. When it comes to this technique, you have to figure out some way to remove mass. So you might have a piece of stone and you're chipping or gouging it away. You might have a hammer and a chisel. Your goal is to remove mass from your block of stone or your block of wood. When it comes to carving, you can do it out of a lot of materials, but typically stone and wood are preferred, mainly because those last for quite a bit of long time. Carving is not something easy to do. It's quite difficult. And it's even more difficult if you're doing it on stone or wood, but it lasts. Now, technically, if you go out and see art in the world, you might find statues made out of foam or chocolate. I've seen statues made out of giant chunks of soap. If you go to the fair, like the a big state fair, you might see someone carving out of butter. So technically, you could do it out of a lot of stuff, but most artists prefer something that will stand the test of time. Now, when it comes to carving, one of the most famous groups of artists to be well known for carving are the Egyptians, the ancient Egyptians. Here we have Menkari and his wife. So this is an Egyptian pharaoh with his wife. When it comes to the Egyptians, they were very conscientious about the material. When you look at this couple here, you'll notice that when it comes to the gap between them, between their legs and their waist, the artist has left a lot of stone behind. When it comes to stone, it still can be kind of fragile. And the Egyptians were very concerned about their statues breaking. Uh, the reason that's the case is the ancient Egyptians believed that their spirit could find refuge in a statue. So basically after you, you die, your spirit can come back to your corpse, back to earth. Or if by chance your corpse is desecrated or destroyed, then it could go to a statue that has your likeness to it. So here we have a pharaoh. He highly values his soul. So it's logical that the artist would be very conservative for us, the pose and how they carved out this portrait. Even when it comes to Menkari's legs, he's taking a step forward. There's stone that's been left in between that gap. It's all about making sure that this lasts forever. Now, when it comes to the carving technique, a lot of times it's not just you carve it and it's perfect. It's a gradual process. One thing that artists will do if they are carving out a piece of marble, like marble is expensive. A lot of these stones are not cheap. And if you make a mistake, well, you have not just wasted a very expensive material, but also potentially a lot of time. So these artists, as they're carving a statue, they'll have a uh, a model of it. And typically this model is made out of clay. So here we have someone doing Abraham Lincoln. They have their model. Then they have their piece of stone and they're gradually removing material away. So the initial process is very rough. And then once they feel satisfied with how it looks in the end, that's when they go super pristine. They don't go pristine off the get go. That would be potentially wasting a lot of time if you make a big, big mistake. Now, to make sure 
that the stone carving is like the model. They will have a tool that's basically like a measuring stick, and they'll go back and forth between the stone sculpture and the model measuring. So you often see like these little dots. That's basically places where the artist has double checked their work. They double check to make sure the spacing between the head and the neck is like this, or the nose to the back of the head is this space. So it's kind of a very tedious process if you're trying to shoot for a particular particular look or you're trying to capture someone's likeness because once you carve something away that material is gone it is a permanent loss so it, it is difficult to do it is not easy now a technique that is a lot more forgiving is modeling so modeling is an additive process carving is subtractive modeling is additive you're using a soft material and you're molding it into something new and clay is the most common material used for modeling, but you could technically do this with anything that is soft and malleable. And when it comes to clay, you'll often hear the term ceramics applied to it. So ceramics means any work out of clay. A great example of an old work made of clay is the terracotta warriors. So if you ever see these statues, you might mistake them for iron, but actually they are all made out of clay. Terracotta clay, if you don't know what that is, it, that refers to a clay that's red in color. If you ever go to the art store and look at the clays that they have, you'll notice that they'll be all different types. And depending on where the clay comes from, it will have a certain color to it. Like if you were to go drive down to Tennessee, Tennessee, the, there's tons of clay in the earth there. So that clay is red. That would be a terracotta type of clay. Some clay, a lot of clay is white, some clay is gray, some clay is even black or brown. Now there's multiple techniques when it comes to making a structure with ceramics. One of the most common is coiling. So coiling is when you have these tubes of clay or that you roll out and then you stack them on one another. This may have been something you've done. When it comes to really young artist, one of the first projects your art teacher might have you try out is to make a coiled pot. So if you've done this, you kind of have an idea of what's up. To make a coil pot, you'll have your base and then you stack these coils on top of one another. And one of the reasons that this is done is for the, for you to have a clay sculpture. Say you weren't making a pot, but maybe you're making an egg. Well, for you to make your sculpture survive the firing process. So the firing process makes your clay hard and durable. It has to be hollow and air needs to be, be able to get out of the sculpture. If air is, if, it, if it's a solid piece of clay, odds are there's gonna be an air bubble in it and the sculpture will explode and just fall apart on itself. To avoid air bubbles and sculptures exploding, you have to make them hollow and you need to have a hole for the air to escape that hollow chamber on the inside. So that's one reason you might do the coiling process is it naturally creates something that is hollow versus solid. Now coils can be left behind as a, a decorative element. A lot of times when I see coil pots made by little kids, they'll do cool little swirls with it but you could smooth it all out. It just depends on your preference. So here's an example of some coils that have been left behind and have been manipulated in a way to make the cup or the vase more interesting. We have little uh, circles of clay, little swirls, and then we have normal bands of co coils of clay here. So some artists, they like this, some they don't care for this texture and they'll smooth it all out. Another technique that's ideal for ceramics is slab building. And once again, you end up with a hollow sculpture. That's very ideal. Now with slab building, as the name implies, you rely on slabs. You'll roll out your clay with a rolling pin as if you're making cookie dough, and then you let it sit. And you might want to say a cone or a cylinder. If you want a cylinder, as you let it sit, you'll put it in a cylindrical shape and they'll stiffen up and then you can easily 
glue it together with other pieces of clay. Or if you want to make a box, you might have different squares of clay and then once they stiffen up, you glue them together with clay. So to give you some examples of slab building, here we have various bases created with slab building. This slab building is great if you like sharp edges, if you want something that is geometric to make this type of vase, these vases with say carving, like you're taking a chunk of clay and you're trying to carve it out, it's actually probably going to be more time consuming than if you were to build it all with these slabs. Now that said, you can have organic shapes with slab building. If you want something that looks kind of like a flower or a, a tulip or a calla lily, you could use slab building and roll it around and let it stiffen up and have something kind of unique. You can also combine these techniques. So here on the right, we have these leaves. These leaves were made with slab building. And to get that leaf texture, they probably had a leaf, they put it on a slab of clay, they cut out that leaf, and the veins of the leaf left that indentation. So later on, they emphasized it with the coloring they added on it, with it. But here you also have coiling. So you can combine multiple different techniques if you're working with ceramics. Another process you're going to see is pinching. And once again, this is maybe a technique that you've already tried out. If your art teacher didn't have you do a, a coiling pot, maybe they made you do a pinch pot. And as the name implies, you're just pinching the surface into a particular shape. Now, pinching is great for irregular forms or things that are more organic in nature. So I have a couple examples. Here we have this cat statue. It is a very organic shape, lots of curves. Pinching would be the most convenient way to shape the clay into this cat. And sometimes artists might pinch a vessel or pinch a sculpture into the right shape. It might not be hollow at the get-go, but once it stiffens up, they might carve it all out from the inside and empty out the guts of the sculpture. So that's pretty common. So it varies from artist to artist how they like to do the technique. Some artists like to pinch something hollow off the get-go. Some artists like to pinch something and then hollow it out after it stiffens up. The last major technique when it comes to ceramics is wheel throwing. So wheel throwing, you basically have this pedestal and you have this big chunk of often, it's like a big wheel uh, out of concrete. And you kick that big concrete wheel and it spins the smaller wheel on top and you get this circular movement. Or you might have something that does it all that is ele electrical. And ma mainly you're working on this pedestal that spins around really fast and you have a piece of clay on there and you're trying to make typically functional items. Like if, if you see someone who is a wheel thrower, they're usually making vases, cups, bowls, hollow vessels for everyday use. Although technically you could probably turn it into sculpture if you really wanted to. One great thing when it comes to wheel throwing is it's a very fast technique. If you wanted to make a lot of stuff to sell, Wheel throwing is your best bet. So that's why you see a lot of artists who make practical items like cups, bowls. They often rely on wheel throwing for it because it's such a fast process. And that's kind of crucial. A lot of people don't want to spend big money on a cup or a bowl. So if you can speed up your process, then you can make more stuff to sell. So this, we have a whole bunch of vases here. This person probably made these all in one day. So that's a lot of different items to just make in, in one day of work. Now, when it comes to wheel throwing, the process in itself is simple to understand, but it's one of those things that takes a lot of practice to master. It is very difficult to do off the get-go. There is a learning curve, even though it's one of those things like, oh, that looks easy. And then you try it out and you realize, oh, this is actually quite challenging. With wheel throwing, you, you have your wheel that spins around, you put in a chunk of clay on it, and your first goal is to get it centered in the wheel. If your clay is not in the dead center of the wheel, then it'll get all loppy and just 
fly off or fall apart. So that's very crucial. That's one of the most difficult things to master is to get it in the center because you have to use a lot of force and water. Once it's centered on your wheel, then you can make it hollow. So you have this lump is totally centered and then you put your thumb or finger through the, the middle of it and you stretch a hole into the piece of clay. And then once it's your desired shape, you start to stretch the walls up. So you pinch the bottom and you drag your fingers, pulling clay up, pinching clay up to make a thinner wall. So that, that can be challenging as well because that on a big pot can take a lot of force and you're balancing water. Like water is your lubricant. Like when things spin around, if they're not lubricated, it'll be very rough. So you're using a lot of water and that's a balancing act because if there's too much water, then your pot can fall apart because it is losing structural integrity with all that water being added. Now, when it comes to ceramics, after you've built something, you got to fire it. So firing is when the clay is heated up in a kiln and this has to be a slow process. If you try to fire a piece of clay really quickly, it will probably fall apart. It, it can easily break. It has to be a steady change in heat. So firing is done not just to harden up the clay, but you also do this if you want to add colors to your glaze, to your to your sculpture. Uh, there, these colors are often called glazes. Now, greenware is a term you'll hear ceramic artists use to describe clay that hasn't been fired yet. So if you hear an uh, artist say they have a whole bunch of greenware, that is very delicate stuff. That is stuff that will shatter if it is handled too roughly. Bisque is when a piece of clay has been fired. And bisque is something that is very strong. Now, a kiln can take on different shapes. But if you look at your typical kiln, this is probably what you're going to see in, say, an art classroom or a small studio. You're going to have this chamber. And it's going to have this metal coating. It'll have a lid. The little white knobs that you see, you'll often remove one of those so air, there could be airflow within the kiln. There's also a heating element. So that you'll have bricks that insulate the chamber and then there'll be these heated coils that will help heat the chamber up. Now glaze, I mentioned that. Glaze is often used to give a ceramic vessel color but also to make it waterproof. Some glazes can also add texture and have very unique effects. So let me show you some examples of glazes. On the left, we have a terracotta pot and the glaze there is the green stuff that kind of looks like moss. So some glaze will not just add color, but it'll add a texture to it. And it's all based off of the materials, like depending on what materials you add together and the heating, it can cause the glaze to go crazy. Like this glaze was smooth initially, then when it was fired up, it reacted to the heat and made all these little holes. On the right, we have a glaze that had crystals in it. So if you have a glaze with crystals, it'll make these beautiful little balloon type of shapes on the surface of your vase or your cup. Now, another type of glaze you're going to see that will have a wide variety of effects is Raku glaze. So Raku glaze are often have lead in them. So if you see something that's labeled as Raku, don't drink from it, don't eat from it. It has lead in the glaze. That said, these type of glazes create very unique effects. Like Raku glazes have effects that you can't see in other types of glazes. Uh, with Raku, you basically add the glaze and you heat it up in the kiln, get it hot, and then you put you either dip it into materials or put materials on top of it. So this pot on the left is actually kind of metallic in nature. You, it looks kind of like copper or silver that's been heated up. So you have blues, purples, some oranges there. It, it would be kind of shiny in person. So that's very unique. You, you can't get that effect with any other type of glaze besides Raku. The pot in the middle, that's horsehair glazing. So with that, they, they have the glaze and they heat up the pot and then they put horsehair across it. It'll make these interesting lines. 
The last type of pot you might see with Raku is a crackle glaze. So not all crackled glaze pots are Raku, but to get a nice crackle, typically you have to do this technique if you want the crackle to be very pronounced, very visible. And with that, you have the glaze and you'll, you might dip it into some straw and it'll cause the glaze to create this interesting crackle. So that's ceramics. Another technique that you're going to see with sculpture is casting. And technically ceramics, can, you can do casting with ceramics. It do, is a process you could do with clay, but often casting is connected with metals. If you see a giant metal sculpture, there's a very high likelihood it was done with the casting process. Now casting is an additive process. You are adding liquids together into a mold to create a sculpture. Now the liquids, they either have to cool down or dry out depending on the material. One of the big perks of a mold is you can reuse it. So if you ever go to a few art museums, you might notice a famous statue it, that's in multiple museums. Uh, for example, I remember there, there's a very famous sculpture, metal statue of a ballerina made by Degas. I noticed it was at two different places. And then I realized, oh, it's, it's casted. So there's, he probably casted the sculpture more than once. So that's a huge perk. Another big perk is, well, it's metal. Metal is really going to last. Uh, unless someone comes in and decides to melt it. But if, if you are just leaving it outside, it's going to be hard for anything to destroy it. For, compared to, say, wood or stone or ceramics like metal is one of the most toughest materials out there so with metal or ceramics i should say if you're doing casting with ceramics you'll often find find molds made out of different parts so on the right we have this mold which is two parts and is making this honey jar type of pot now, some molds might have multiple parts. So on the other side, we have a vase with a top on it that has five parts. So if you're doing casting with ceramics, you're usually pouring a liquid clay into the plaster mold and the plaster sucks the moisture out of the clay. After it sits in there for a while, you pour out the excess clay and then you have your thin, hollow ceramic vessel. If you ever go to the store and you see ceramic vessels or little ceramic trinkets, a lot of times this is the process that's used. So if you go to the Dollar Tree and you find a ceramic skull during Halloween, well, that was probably made with a mold similar to this. So it's with ceramics, it's very easy to mass produce something with uh, this casting technique. Now with metal, you could do a similar thing if you're doing a solid mold like you see before you end up with basically a paperweight. So some metal sculptures are totally solid. They're very heavy. If that's the case, they tend to be very small. Now, some artists want to make big metal sculptures. Now, that's something kind of problematic because if you were to try to cast a metal sculpture like we see with the ceramic sculptures, you're going to have a, a metal sculpture that is extremely heavy and very expensive. To fix this problem, uh, you had artists figure out the lost wax casting technique. So this is kind of a complicated process. Basically, you have a model that's created by the artist. They send that model to a foundry to actually cast it because the foundry basically has to make a mold of the model and... They'll have to att attach metal bars to it. They have to cover it with uh, cement casing. They have to fill it with metal. They have to break it out, then clean it up. So it's very complicated, but it's worthwhile because your metal sculpture is going to be astronomically lighter. So you'll be able to move it a bit easier. Still, even with this process, if you have a sculpture that's life-size of a person, it's still going to be insanely heavy, but at least not as heavy. But also, it'll be less expensive. If, this, if you had sculptures that were solid bronze, they would be far, far more pricey to create. 
especially in the past like the this technique goes all the way back to ancient greek times and back in the past bronze was a very valuable material so you wouldn't want to waste it so much on a sculpture i mean you, you would you might want a nice sculpture of your god or your goddess but you'd want to use a lot of that bronze for other practical things like swords shields armor so and that gave the greeks incentive to try to figure out a solution to the, the, the metal problem, and they come up with the lost wax casting technique. When it comes to metal, casting is not the only way to manipulate metal. When it comes to blacksmithing, this is basically, you're using a forge. So you have this fire pit, you put your metal into it, you get it hot, and then you beat it with a hammer and turn it into the, your desired shape. So here we have this blacksmith, he has his his forge. He's using either iron or steel. Those are the two most, most common materials. And to bend it into the shape that he wants, he has to periodically heat it up and just take that hammer and whack it into his desired shape. Now, some other things a blacksmith might make, if you find really nice knives, that's a very common thing for blacksmiths to create. They sell pretty well. Like a knife is something that you can make beautiful, but also it's very practical. But you also have gates. So anything that you're using a forge for and you're relying on iron and steel, you would often see a blacksmith create that. That said, a blacksmith might create other more common stuff, more mundane stuff. If you go to the past and you see a blacksmith, a lot of times they're making handles, they're making nails, they're making doorknobs, nothing fancy. So when it comes to art, very few blacksmiths were well off enough to do fine art or do swords or to do knives. Most blacksmiths were making very mundane things. They actually were not paid very well. Another type of artist that works with metals is a metalsmith. So they also make practical items, but also they can make some sculptural stuff as well, depending on the artist you talk to. If you talk to a blacksmith these days, a lot of times that refers to someone who makes jewelry. If you take a blacksmithing class at a university, most of the time you're either going to make small little trinkets, small little boxes, or pieces of jewelry, or little dainty sculptures. So this is quite a bit different than a blacksmith. A blacksmith, they have the open fire, it's pretty dirty. A metalsmith, their work can be a little bit more delicate. Now, a metalsmith might also do casting, but they're relying on thin sheets of metal. They're relying on little saws, little hammers. They might work with soldering, and they'll make often jewelry. Here we have a couple of examples of necklaces or pendants that they might create. And they also have to learn other techniques. So they might have to learn how to change the color of metal. They might have to learn how to set stones. So metalsmith, they might also make some practical stuff as well. If you go to an art museum and you see armor, like knight's armor, that would have been made by a metalsmith, not a blacksmith. So when it comes to metalsmithing, it, it, it has a wide scope. But these days, if you hear someone, they say they're a metalsmith, think they're usually making jewelry. Now, when it comes to metal, I talked about some artists might want to color it. Now we have a specific term for coloring metal. That is a patina. So a patina is when metal changes color. Some of that is natural. So here we have this sculpture, this Greek sculpture. Initially, the sculpture would have had this gold. It would have been bronze. The hair may have been darkened, may have had this, the, and that would have been a patina. Like the darkened hair would have been a patina. But a lot of times you'll find sculptures and they have this greenish tinge to them. That's just nature changing the color of the metal. So sometimes artists will just let nature take charge of the color of the metal. Rust is another example of nature changing the color of the metal. And some artists will either force that or just wait for that to happen to their sculptures. But there's other ways you can color metal versus letting it sit outside. One thing you might do to change the color of a metal is you can use heat. So if you see a metalsmith and they have a beautiful copper bracelet like we see here and you see these rainbow colors on it, 
that is a heat patina. So they just heated up the metal, and when you get to get it to a particular temperature, it'll start shifting in color. Now to preserve it, they have to cover this copper with a protective coating because copper, if you don't cover this patina, this coloring with a coating, the the copper will continue to react with the air and, and then the colors will go away and it will be kind of muddy in color. So if you see this, it will have a protective coating to protect that beautiful coloring. On the right, we have some more bracelets and this patina is created by ammonia fumes. So one thing you might do is you might have a chamber, a small chamber and you put ammonia in it. You'll hang your jewelry in there and in a short period of time, I can't remember how long this takes, but it's, it doesn't take like months. It, I think it takes a week or less. I'd have to double check. But those ammonia fumes, they react to the surface of the metal and they'll leave this beautiful turquoise coloring on it. So you might use heat, you might use chemicals of different kinds to change the color of your metal. Another type of sculpture, we have an assemblage. So an assemblage is an additive process. An assemblage is basically you're taking different materials and combining them together into a single object. So a great ex example of this is Puppy by Jeff Koons. This has so much stuff in it. And basically we have this cute giant dog made out of flowers. Now these are not plastic flowers. These are real flowers. When it comes to flowers, if you've ever tried to grow them, especially in a pot, they're not going to last super long. So for this sculpture to not die out and turn brown and ugly, he had to, had to add a lot of extra stuff. We, he had to have a stainless steel frame. There needs to be soil for the flowers. There, the flowers are held in these geotextile uh, fabric pots. You have water. You need an internal irrigation system. Because look at this puppy. This puppy is huge. If When you look at the building in the back, it looks like this puppy is maybe three stories tall, two stories tall, depending on how far back that building is. So if you wanted to water these flowers, you would need a giant ladder to get to the flowers on top. So it's more logical to have that irrigation on the inside. And then you have the flowers themselves. So you have a whole bunch of different stuff used to create this one object. So it's additive because you're adding stuff together. And an assemblage, another way to think about it is it's like a 3D collage. So a collage is when you take different materials and they're, it's 2D, like you're using newspaper, uh, printer paper, notepad paper, magazine paper, stuff like that, and you're gluing it together. Assemblage, you're just using 3D stuff. Here's another example of an assemblage. So it's pretty much open game as far as what can be turned into assemblage. Here we have this work by Robert Rauschenberg called Monogram. We actually have a painting for, for the base of the sculpture. Then we have a tire and then we have a goat <laughs> that has been put through this tire, this taxidermy goat, and there's been paint applied to the face. So this also is an assemblage. It's a whole bunch of different materials, kind of odd materials, that's been meshed together into one sculpture. Another type of work that we could sometimes consider an assemblage, depending on how much effort is put into it, is a ready-made. So a ready-made is an artwork created from manufactured objects that the artist has modified a little bit. Usually the modification is not huge. And a very famous example of this is the bicycle wheel by Duchamp. Now we don't have the original, that's not too uncommon with Duchamp's work. And this is a replica. And for Duchamp, he wasn't trying to make very philosophical art. This is not deeply conceptual. He was just interested in the movement of the bicycle wheel. So he has this stool, he paints it white, then he puts the bicycle wheel on top. And if you're going into the gallery to look at it, he wanted you to spin it. So it's kind of a kinetic sculpture. It's an interactive sculpture, but it's also a ready-made. So it's a ready-made because the stool is ma manufactured. It is mass-produced. Like you can see the stool all over the place. Same for a bicycle wheel. Like anyone can find a bicycle wheel. That's not something entirely made by the artist. So that's what 
makes a ready-made a ready-made. An assemblage, you might have stuff like that in it, but it might have things that are not, say, manufactured on a mass level on it. Another type of art is site-specific. Now, technically, site-specific art can apply to different types of mediums. It doesn't have to be a sculpture, but a lot of times, sculptures fall into this category. But it can also be a painting. When it comes to this piece, we have Bernini's The Ecstasy of St. Teresa. This is a great example of a site-specific art. And it's made to be in a single, single location. A lot of religious art is often site-specific but it's been removed from the location. Like it, it may have been sold by the church or maybe the church is no longer there or maybe the person who owned it can no longer keep it so they sell it off. So when you look at old religious paintings, it, it may have been created to be in a certain part of that chapel or of that church. And this is very much the case for the, the ecstasy of St. Teresa. So what we have going on here, I'll give you a little bit of an explanation. We have St. Teresa, who is was re basically recently turned into a saint. So she passed away shortly thereafter she was turned into a saint. And a very famous family decided to have the sculpture created to be put into a chapel. Now, when it comes to St. Teresa... She was famous for her writings. From a very young age, she suffered from, she was kind of a sickly person. She, she was often ill and often had fevers. She, because she was often sick, she would have vivid visions. So she might have a fever and start to see spiritual things pop up in, in, in her vision. So one of her most famous visions is that an angel came into her bedroom with an arrow and be began to stab her in the chest with it. And it filled her with ecstasy. It, if, it was not painful. It was actually a delightful experience for her. And she had a lot of visions that were kind of weird like that. And that's one of the reasons why she became well known is that would have been interesting stuff to read way, way back in the past. So let's look at the sculpture as a whole. You have the main sculpture of St. Teresa and the angel stabbing her in the chest. She's moaning because she's enjoying it. She looks like she's on a cloud. There's these beams behind her, bronze beams. There's actually a little window above it. So the bronze beams, they look like they're lighting up. Then on the side of this little chapel. So this is like a, when it comes to... This chapel. Uh, a chapel can be part of a bigger church. A chapel can be a little, uh, a little nook in a larger church. So this is called. This is in the Cornaro Chapel, and this is a s little small nook in this larger church. So on the sides of this nook, you actually have these theater boxes, and you have the Cornaro family here. So it's it's the Cornaro Chapel. It's this little nook in this church. It's not like a giant building, and you have the family members of the Cornaro who basically commissioned this work to be here and, and admiring this scene. So you have theater boxes. It's almost like they're watching the, the ecstasy of St. Teresa as if it's a show and then doing commentary on it. On the floor, you have skeletons on there that are praying. Basically, these are momentum mores. And then you have this elaborate architecture surrounding the sculpture. So this is a site-specific work. All of this is made to be in this particular spot here. So that's what site-specific means. If you take a site-specific work and you were to remove this, it would lose a massive part of its value. Or it might lose a massive part of its history or a massive part of its meaning. So with site-specific work, if you remove it from the site it was meant to be, it is actually very detrimental to the piece. So that's one good thing to keep in the back of your mind when you're thinking about site-specific is that location is very crucial, at least for the artists and the people that created it. Another work that's similar, and often a site-specific work will often be an installation. Technically, we could say the ecstasy of St. Teresa is an installation as well because it relies on space. So installations... They incorporate space into the experience of the artwork. And the one of the major goals often is to change the viewer's percep 
perception of that space. One great artist who d really plays with installations and your sense of space is Yayoi Kusama. She is famous for mirror rooms. If you ever see Kusama pop up as an artist at a museum, I strongly recommend going to see her work because I have photographs of it. It is hard to really get a sense of the how this impacts you mentally to, to go into the space. It Photos don't capture the beauty of her work or the experience of her work. You, you need to be there to really understand how it warps your sense of space. With these in these infinity mirror rooms, there's different kinds. Some of them have pumpkins on the floor. Some of them have lights. Some of them have polka dots. These rooms are actually rather small, but due to it being filled with infinity mirrors, you have mirrors on all sides, these spaces feel massive. But on top of that, when you go into these spaces, not only do you see what's reflected over and over and over again in the room, you also get a sense of yourself being reflected over and over again. So if you're looking at your reflection, any movement you make, it's hard not to notice. Another example of one of her rooms. Here we have, a, once again, a very small room. Like this is the size of, say, a very small bedroom. It's quite small. But it, it feels massive. It feels huge. It almost feels like you're in this forest or in this field of these weird polka dot statues. Uh, they, they're almost su supposed to be phallic in nature. It, it, it's it's her thing. She likes that type of, or she's interested in that type of subject matter. So if you if you got that vibe of this kind of looks phallic, uh, you're not wrong. But once again, you, you if you were to come in here, you see your reflection. You see the reflection of these phallic symbols. <laughs> Your sense of space would be thrown off. So this is a great exam example of an installation work that really messes with your sense of space. Now that's not necessary. It, it, you might just have a work that relies on space for its composition, for its layout. That Saint, The Ecstasy of St. Teresa is a great example of it. But some of these works really play with space and your sense of it. Another type of sculpture are earthworks. Earthworks are almost always site specific. One of the reasons that's the scale, scale the, one of the reasons that's the case is they're large in scale. And one of the key components for earthworks is it needs to be strongly incorporating the natural environment around it and be made with natural materials. A uh, great example of this is Smithson's Spiral Jetty. Now this is over in the Salt Lake. It's basically to create it, they had to get truckloads of dirt and rocks and create this structure out into the lake. So they just kept on dumping these rocks until they ended up with a spiral in the salt lake. This is huge. So that's one attribute it fulfills as far as earthworks. It also is made out of natural materials. And then far as engaging with the environment, it interacts with the water and the life within the water. So when you look at this photo, you'll notice that outside of the spiral, the water is more bluish in nature. But when you look on the inside of the spiral, it, it's oddly reddish. Now that's not dirt. That's actually red algae that, it, that has been trapped in there. So this work basically traps the red algae for its visual appeal. So it's interacting with its environment. So this is an earthwork. It, it fulfills all those major requirements. Another example of an earthwork. Here we have a work by Patrick Daughtry. Here's looking at you. Once again, you have natural materials. Once again, it's very large. And you, it's not heavily engaged with the environment. It, but it seems like this was put here on purpose around these trees. So far as it, it needs to react to the environment, that's not an absolute crucial element, but being made out of natural materials, being large, that, that's typically the case with these types of sculptures. The last type of sculpture, and, and this is not exactly sculpture, uh, and this is, I'm just kind of throwing this here because it's the most convenient spot to put performance art. Performance art, there might be no sculpture involved, uh, but a lot of times there's props when it comes to this type of art form. Performance art is art that incorporates 
something visual and it ha it's basically like this dramatic performance. Now, one artist that's very famous for performance art is Marina Abramovic. And here's her piece holding the skeleton. Now, for this performance, this she's basically almost meditating as she holds the skeleton. Basically, the work is about contemplating death. And that's the work. She's here in this room, meditating, holding the sculpture. That's the art. When it comes to for performance art, there's a pretty wide gap for as what's considered for performance art, but just don't get it confused with plays, operas, theater. Like that's a whole different thing. A play is not considered performance art when it comes to fine art. It, it's in its own. It, it's in a separate category. I'll show you a couple of other examples of performance art. And one thing I'll quickly mention is. One thing you might wonder is how do you make money if you're a performance artist? Uh, I mean, you could charge money for people to come in and watch your performance, but that could be kind of difficult um, to get enough money, enough people to come in and watch it, especially when a lot of times these performances are rather bizarre. Uh, these artists would, will often do photography of their performance. So they might do their performance and then sell their photographs for big, big money. And that's sort of the thing that an art collector might take because you can't really capture a performance. I mean, you can do video. I'm sure some performance artists sell videos, but a lot of times I've noticed they'll do photographs. Here's another one of Abramovix works. For this performance, she is surrounded by meat, <laughs> cow bones. And she is, her for her performance, she's in the stress and she's trying to clean these cow bones. With Abramovic, her work can be quite strange, quite bizarre, but when it comes to this piece, it's actually about war. Uh, it, it's about the Kosovo War from a while back ago, and that's actually her homeland. That's where she comes from. So you can imagine the devastation of finding out that there's war in your homeland, and this is, you could think of her trying to cope with those emotions or how she feels about the devastation of that war. You, now it kind of makes sense. If you don't have that context, she looks like a crazy lady. <laughs> it's like, why would you do this? But when you know, oh, this is about the chaos and horror of war and death, then it, it's like, okay, that makes sense. And, and you would want this to kind of be jarring. You know, when, if you're anti-war, you don't want to sugarcoat things. You you want to show how brutal it is. And this is a a pretty good way to do it. Like versus saying show photos of corpses that are blown apart. This is a little is a, it is harsh, but not as bad as seeing like photographs of actual people that have been killed during the conflict. Here's another artist, Charlene Schlanzel. For her performance, she actually draws. She creates art out of sand. So she will have a projector, she'll go to different places, and she'll very quickly work with the sand to create these interesting landscapes with people in them or flowers. So when it comes to performance art, there is a, a wide gap. Some of it's very strange, like the works by Abramovic. Some of them were far more lighthearted. It's kind of free game. The main thing is performance art is not plays. It's not theater. It is far, usually more simple than that. And it's often focused on a single act, you could say, or action. So that's all I have for sculpture. If you have any questions, let me know.